con consumption at a low of seven years. Uh, you know, whole macro numbers looking downwards uh, at historic lows. Uh, what were you really thinking of when you were presenting this budget? Did you have to balance a lot of factors? You had to keep growth in mind on one hand and all the rest of it on the other. Absolutely. Um, it was the desire of the government that uh, we address every section which was expecting something out of the budget, if possible. So our attempt was to make sure that we came up with something which would boost consumption, put money for investments and creation of assets, and with private investment being at their pace, and I'm sure they will catch up also. We did not want to, at any point in time, between July and now, cut down on public investments. On the contrary, we have only increased it. So the capex between July and now, if you look at the data, has only gone up. So in a way, we were very clear that whilst we were addressing the supply side issues, it was time for us to make sure that the consumption and also investment, because we wanted to boost up demand, had to be kept up. And that's the so how story. So has, how has the budget addressed these two big concerns that you know, that, the, that, that there, is, there is the demand side problem and, you know, there is, the economy is investment starved. So how have these twin issues got addressed with your budget? And that is one of the reasons why I started by saying private investment will do their own whenever they would take their call on it. And we have given them our intention by cutting the corporate tax. We brought it down to a lowest level. So we wanted to tell them we believe now that you will make decisions with such an attractive tax rate. But from the other side, from the government side, we wanted to make sure the money was going for investment. And that is why the Prime Minister's announcement on Independence Day, Red, uh, Red Fort Address, he spoke about 100 lakh crores in the next five years. We didn't wait for the 100 lakh crores projects to come. We ourselves spent a lot of time talking to states, talking to different uh, private sector people, and putting together a pipeline of 6,500 projects, some of which are greenfield, some of which are brownfield, but all of which, if only attended to through state governments or through private participation with central government, can make a big difference to the entire environment. One, by creating the assets in the infrastructure sector, and two, by making sure that the cascading effect of that will bring in positive impact on industries like cement, iron and steel, and so on. And also give in situ employment opportunity for a lot of people. Now, if that is the way in which we wanted to make sure money was going for investment, I was not just talking off the cuff. One investor facilitation center is being started. Sovereign funds who have all in the last six months been contacting us because they see India as a very positive investment destination. They want to come and invest in India. For them, we had to keep the pipeline ready. No point if they reach here and then search for projects. More, more than that, we've also given them concessions in our fiscal policy. We've given them tax concessions so that if they came and specified, while giving the tax concessions, specified that if they were going to spend it in infrastructure, lock-in period being a certain number of years, three years, we will give them the concession. All this has been tied up. So we are not talking today for it to happen some years later. Everything is kept ready. It should all start playing out sooner. I'll come back to this point a little later. Uh, I want to ask you a broader question. Uh, do you see that the economy has kind of bottomed out? We are seeing uh, projections of the GDP rate, you know, GDP growth rate of six, six and a half percent. How do you see the economy? And when do you think it will start reflecting in a turnaround uh, you know, in the first half or in the second half of this fiscal year, next fiscal year? Well, I thought some of the data which is being released and the kind of comments which you hear from international observers and also the Indian industry themselves are all very clearly indicating that negativity with which people spoke about India immediately after July budget. Yes. They must have had their reasons. I'm not faulting them for it. But the negativity with which they spoke, the sentiment about which they were referring to, 
have all now gone away. At least I have not heard them speak about it. I can see some of the data which is coming through showing that there is a turnaround. So I have a feeling if we keep the space of hearing industry, keeping in touch with them and responding to them, one of course watching also at the same time as to what impact all those interventions which we've done have had, I think we will possibly be moving towards a very constructive pace. Where do you see the green shoots in the economy? Your former finance minister today said that six, six and a half percent is not only an astonishing figure, it's also an irresponsible figure being given by the government. Well, uh, I would have thought that this budget, if anything, has really put in a lot of work to show that we mean every number that we've stated. Right. So, will the budget really stimulate rural demand? I think, you know, one of the things that everyone was looking forward to in this budget, how will rural demand get stimulated? So what are some of the specific things you feel will do that? Um, the fact that after due consideration, nearly 3 lakh crores have been allocated for agriculture and rural development put together. And the various specific schemes which the Prime Minister has been talking about. And the focus on aspirational districts, backward among sure. some of the states which are doing well and backward among those who are not probably doing so well, are chosen, about 112 of them, looking at building hospitals there, getting two-tier and two, uh, three-tier cities in those aspirational districts also to pick up, bringing in SHGs as a backward linkage for aggregation in rural produce, making sure the coastal fishing villages will have their own FPOs, farmer, fish farmer, produce organizations, bringing the Nabad and Mudra to the rural areas to give them more of such loans with which the farmers' issues will be addressed, where silos can be built at taluk level. These are things with which we think the rural issues can be meaningfully addressed. Right. Nirmalaji, why do you think the markets are disappointed with your budget? Have they not understood it in its full, uh, you know, full sweep? Uh, markets are down, you know, Sensex down 1,000 points, Nifty down 300 points. Were they really looking for a big stimulus, you know, in sectors such as infrastructure, real estate, thousand, NBFC? A hundred lakh crore. That's over five, being five years. But yes. I've said the moment there is a requirement, I'll, I'm ready to front load it. The first line itself is, I'm willing to front so load it. So there is a provision I've given in this the budget pipeline. for that? Pipeline investments numbers have been very clearly put. 22,000 crores have already been given for those two companies which are going to do long-term investment in uh, infrastructure funding. Right. So all this is, in any case, today, I think to be fair, the stock market was not in full force. They were there, but many of those uh, uh, concerned wings within the stock markets have not all been functional. It is only Monday Yes. when they have to, and I'm very confident the stock market will understand every aspect of what I've said in this budget and the kind of push that I've given for bond market, right. for deepening the bond market, for strengthening the bond market, and making sure that India understands that there is one world out there which has still not been exploited fully. These are things which I'm sure that the markets will understand and respond by Monday. So you're hopeful that the bond market will react positively to of the budget? Of course. There's never been this many steps taken for bettering the bond market. You've also bank you're also banking a lot on foreign investment. You know, you made it easier for, for uh, sovereign wealth funds to invest in infrastructure. Uh, FPI can invest more in debt now, up from 9% to 15%. But what was the thinking behind this? Only because it is possible now. You you already have a lot of lot number of cases of banks and other such institutions, in, in fact many NBFCs themselves raising funds from outside. They are doing it because they think the cost of borrowing is far lesser when they do it from outside and understandably. It is possible for us to be able to encourage many such borrowing from outside and therefore make the Indian savings be available for many others who really cannot go out to borrow. So whilst opening it up, you're making sure that there is credit availability 
both from borrowing outside and also from inside cost of capital also will come down once you are able to get it from outside right i will go back to the point you were making earlier about this uh, push to infrastructure you know you talked about this 100 uh, lakh crore over to be invested over 5 years uh, you know are you confident that this will be done over a 5 year period and that the prime minister's dream of a 5 trillion economy would be realized by 2024 absolutely because see projects and their absorption capacity also doesn't happen within one year they spread their cost as the project gets completion process you get more and more resource requirement which goes in and therefore to spread it over five year is not so much from our end saying you don't want to spend now you want to live, stagger it it's more the absorption capacity of the project itself even they will take their own time to take more and more even if funds are available they can only take a certain level at any point in time and the economy will grow in double digits to be able to get there in 5 years or will we have to push this deadline uh, well i am making all the necessary steps to give that stimulus in the economy let me come to the fiscal deficit you know the fiscal deficit has slipped yet again to 3.8% my first and direct question is will it lead to a downgrade in india's sovereign rating is there a potential risk of that i don't see that at all because we've been very responsible about the way in which we have used the forbearance in the frbm act the act provides for the forbearance of 0.5 we have not crossed that and the numbers that we've given different heads different places different numbers are all responsible numbers i've even made a mention as to why my numbers this time given the fact that i've used the forbearance are well within the uh, the framework so i don't see india's ratings coming down because we have breached the uh, fiscal number or we have uh, we have in fact we have complied with the framework given to us and if i don't do that and if i'm st stubborn about the number that i have even in today's situation i am expected to spend more how will i do that unless i use the escape clause which is available for me i have not violated beyond that that's right you know uh, nirmala ji the nbfc sector which is a major source of credit also for the economy is in serious trouble what are the steps that you are going to take to assure investors the market that you are working towards solving this big problem so haven't i uh, made a mention that there will be first of all before the budget we had given a partial guarantee scheme for them sure. that they can pool their assets first 10% will be supported by us the stop gap will be given by the government all that and that has been used by several of them the rbi is constantly telling us about reporting on how that is developing even now what we have done is to be able to bring in uh, the msmes so that they don't burden and liquidity is available for nbfcs we've now announced that that kind of a facilitation will be done for the nbfcs also so we've not ignored the liquidity requirement of the nbfcs markets seem to be disappointed you know uh, probably long term capital gains was one expectation that did not happen do you see in the future you know today budget is not the only day when you make all the announcements Uh, would you be looking at more market friendly measures in time to come uh, you know which will give them more confidence do you think the market has seen the ddt having been removed from the companies yeah that 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 was one thing that they were expecting and it did happen it's happened yeah. you know on the personal it front i think uh, you know on the one hand you've delighted the middle class by you know showing the cuts are deep and cuts are serious and that you mean business but on the other hand tax experts say that what you have given from one hand you've taken away from the other how's that you know because you know the exemptions will go away there are some they... exemptions which continue even in the new some of them some of them but huh. uh, but the analysis seems to suggest that you know if somebody is not invested anywhere there are no exemptions it's a definite positive for them but otherwise it has become more complicated you can choose between one or the other and i suppose you can also next year you can move from one to the other as well and come back to it so doesn't it complicate the no, whole no it thing? doesn't see ultimately in india we want a simple easy to comply and lesser rate of tax a taxation system which is easy to comply 
over the decades, I did say that in my budget speech, more than 120 exemption list is available. Now, if you are a taxpayer and looking at 120, imagine what you have to choose from. And does that help you? And I, I fail to understand one point. The incentive given for people for saving have given the money back in your hand. Don't pay tax to me. And that money in your hand, you as an adult earning your wages or salary or profit or whatever, is a rational individual to make a call on how you want to use that money, spend it or save it. So to put this argument to me back saying incentive to save would be gone away, I find it uh, very patronizing that a taxpayer wouldn't be mature enough to take his own decision on his money. In fact, it might open up more avenues of investment for him. Absolutely. Right? It could move he can towards even equity. Go to, or, that's right. Right. So is that the idea? I mean, the idea is... The savings have been coming down over the last three or four that's years. That's right. It should be the choice of the income tax payer as to where he wants to spend his money or keep his money. One. It should also give the comfort to the taxpayer that the system is simple. Eventually, if not today, sometime I would want to see Government of India removing all the exemptions like they do in many of the progressive societies. And if that has got to be done, it's no good if I say it will happen sometime in five years. Yeah. I've taken the first step towards it. But you will eventually move towards replacing it with the new tax regime, which is simple, which is simplified. And which benefits everybody. Which benefits everyone. I've so given numbers, that is why in the speech itself, to say if you were in the old tax regime and if you are in the new what is it that you gain? You still gain nearly 78,000 for those who are in the 15 lakh bracket. Right. By being in the new system. Even if you were using some of the exemptions in the old system, and by you coming into the new, which has very few exemptions given to it, you are still better off. So I'm giving an option. I'm not forcing you to come here. Yeah, but over you, a period of time, it will be simplified. That's and, right. Right. And would you follow this for higher slabs as well? I mean, is the philosophy the same? Simplify, the moment, you know, increase compliance. Philosophy is the same. Yeah, increase compliance and lower the rates. Absolutely. Yeah. So that even in higher slabs, we can accept in the, expect this in the next few years. Well, I don't want to speculate Absolutely on that now. Possible. But now the intention is reach the money to those who need to have them. Reach the money for those who want to spend them. Reach the money for those who want to have money in their hand to call take a call on what they want to do it, the middle class, we reach them first. Eventually, yes, we'll look at others also. Yeah, so the idea is that, you know, increase the spending power at the hands of consumers so yes. that, you know, it gives a boost to the economy as well. You know, your aggressive disinvestment number uh, and largely on the back of the LIC IPO, uh, this... Not largely on the back of LIC Well, IPO. Uh, one, sorry, the usual is, you know, you're getting 120,000 crore from the usual privatization and, and the rest of it, 60,000 crore maybe from uh, IDBI. LIC and IDBI. So I, w what I want to understand is that will you be able to achieve this number? How confident are you of, uh, you know, getting through Air India, Concor, uh, Shipping Corporation? Do you think all this will happen in the coming year? It should happen, shouldn't it? Because I announced something in July budget. To be fair, how quickly does a government machinery move? Between July and February, they've done all the maximum footwork they need to do for reviving the sale of Air India, looking at Concor, looking at others, shipping corporation, and so on. You've listed it all. Right. And in the meanwhile, also attending to something totally different from it, the ETF, which is not a disinvestment, but they're looking at the ETF. Yes. And through ETF, they've shown success as well. Correct. For a government department to move on these fronts so quickly, I announced it in July, and I'm conceding that within this financial year, I may not get the benefit from it, but yes, it will happen in the so next So will you be able to meet your target this year, uh, 1,5,000? No, crore? that's the that's point I'm making, right? right? They have done all the footwork. I don't see it getting done before 31st March, although I did say I want this happening before the end of March. The extent of footwork that they had to do look at the fresh terms of conditions and so on so it will move in but because the... of this footwork next year you'll be able to do two lakh ten thousand crore that's it that you're confident of that's right okay uh, you know the other interesting scheme that is vivat se vishwas scheme uh, how much are you planning to mop up because of this you know your earlier scheme for indirect taxes has been a hit you've been able to garner a substantial amount in just four months 
uh, if I if I remember right, about uh, forty thousand. That's right. Right. So, uh, what is your expectation from this? I have a feeling that people are fed up of litigation, and uh, they have been waiting for a scheme. This is not amnesty. I am very clearly telling them that they have to pay the disputed tax amount. But what we are willing to completely forego is the penalty on it, the interest on it, the uh, interest, say, upper interest on it, and so on, provided they join it before 31st March 2020, giving two full months on it. Right. And if you miss March 2020, yes, till June you may do it, but that would be on a slightly different rate of some more penalty to be, or some more, some money to be added to it. So I am very clear, at least from the way in which between July and now, I've been meeting with a lot of people all over the country in talking with them about taxation, the harassment that they tell me they undergo and so on, that they are looking for a decent option to close this whole chapter. So I guess... Yeah, the money stuck is huge, I think, close to That's 6 right. lakh. Neither they crore. nor government benefits from it. Right. So you're hopeful to get yes. a big number this Very year? Positive. Itself, in Very positive. 31st March? I guess so. Okay. Another question that, you know, even uh, former Prime, uh, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley Ji had uh, raised last year. It was very nice of you to bring him in today, uh, a very personal touch there. Uh, you know, he spoke a lot about, last year he spoke about investigative adventurism. Today you spoke about the same thing as well. You know, you said, said the tax harassment will not be tolerated at all. We've he, come with this charter. Right. Taxpayers' charter, yes. which is getting enshrined in the statutes. Yes. We'll probably be the fourth country in the whole world, which USA, Canada, Australia are the only three, as much as I know, who have got a tax charter. Right. So no good for us to go on saying that we trust the taxpayer. We're showing it in action. Right. We're putting it into the law. But you know, from what you say and what is happening on the ground is pretty different. You know, every other day we hear of tax raids, ED and CBI raids, you know, and this is building, this is impacting business sentiment in some sense. What would you say to that? No, that's exactly the point I'm telling. The intent of the government is not just to go on saying, now we are proving it that we are enshrining it in the law itself, that taxpayers will have to be given a certain, you know, assurance that we respect them. But one line I would take this opportunity to say. If there is gross evasion or if there is a very substantial reason to pursue somebody because of money laundering, mm -hmm. I can't now tell my agencies to sit back and say, no, no, it is giving a bad impression. They'll have to keep doing their lawful job. Right. If there is evasion, if there is money laundering, I cannot for the life of me think that I should look the other way right. and not enforce law. I want to draw that fine distinction between harassment, which should not happen, right. but pursuing wrongdoers. Right. Another uh, point, Nirmalaji, related to, I mean, it's not related to the budget directly, but you know, we've seen a lot of CAA protests in the country over the last few weeks. Uh, you've also seen a lot of international press, which is turning against India. Do you think it impacts business sentiment and will it hamper at some point capital flows into the country? I don't think because the data in the last two, three months is that the flow is continuing. In fact, many of the sovereign funds have been inquiring with us as to where they can put their money. I've announced some concessions for them. I don't think it's affecting India's image because we may have started late, but we have very clearly explained that it goes against nobody. Right. And it doesn't question the citizenship of anybody. It is a law to give citizenship and not remove citizenship. And it is something which suited all political parties when they were in power. They gave assurances, but they didn't fulfill. This is not something which we have come to do today without taking the mandate of the people on it. We put it in our manifesto. Many other parties have also put it in the manifesto. We have gone to the public seeking vote inclusive of this point, and we've got the mandate. Are we to do the job or not? So I don't think we have done anything as a surprise. 
The other point about, you know, the corporate India leaders sometimes complain about micromanagement at the highest level. You know, in fact, uh, Tata Chairman N. Chandrasekharan recently even said, you know, that supervision is good, but suspicion is not. What would you do to, I know that you've also been meeting a lot of corporate leaders over the past few months. Uh, what would you say to corporate India's captains, you know, who are looking to you for guidance? The faceless assessment is one of them. There's not going to be a human interface now in, in tax-related matters. It's all going to be using technology, artificial intelligence, big data. We are going to use all of them to see where there is an element of suspicion. Even then, we are going to only, through digital mode, ask questions. We're giving a number for everything so that it is centrally generated. And the, and the local level, no discretionary settlement happens. So all this is towards establishing credibility of the system. Today you have in your budget raised custom duty on a host of household items. Are you finally listening to your core voter base who has been really upset since demonetization or has really struggled after demonetization? Well, I don't think there is a direct link between demonetization and this step. This is a step where very clearly Indian MSMEs who are producing good quality goods which are end products, they are not raw materials, household goods, which were all being marketed and sold by them. Now when at half of the cost of production, it comes like a cheap dumping of goods into India. These